my humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piran Sivasangarad, Guru Piran Nyo, fellow Nyanis. Uh, I'm going to continue with uh, the science of meditation. How does one prepare for meditation? And we covered quite extensively the last few class on state of the human mind. We see that uh, many people try to uh, meditate. At least in the beginning, they find it very difficult. And uh, over the many years uh, of practicing this and also reading, uh, introspecting, contemplating, reflecting, uh, I realized that there are a few things that we need to do uh, to be able to help us uh, get a more, uh, you know, deeper uh, meditational practice. Uh, oftentimes, you know, uh, we often are so busy with our day-to-day -day lives. You know, we are so caught up with the interactions in the material world. Uh, some challenging, some uh, uh, gives us exuberant feelings, you know, and so on. So these things imprint in our mind. Even when those events uh, have passed on, uh, the experience still reverberates in the mind. And when we go and sit down for meditation, uh, it magnifies for some people. So here are a few things that we can do to help us prepare for meditation. As I said earlier, in everything in life, we have to prepare. Uh, they say that success comes to the prepared mind. In that same way, success uh, of our meditational sadhanas comes for those who prepare their mind. So what do we mean by this? And I said we need to really understand the factors that impact the state of our mind. You know, what impacts peace, tranquility, quietude of our mind. These are all very important uh, state of our mind. And uh, to get to the peaceful mind, we need to learn to see what are the thoughts that our mind generates. You know, what are the thoughts that make our mind shrunken? What are the thoughts that make our mind exuberant? You know, what are the thoughts that make our mind inspirational and expansionary? Only through this practice of attaining that peace and tranquility and quietude in the mind, we see that we are able to access the wisdom knowledge that is embedded in all of us, the wisdom knowledge of the universe, the wisdom knowledge of the creator, of this universe, we call it God, we call it many, many names, and the spark of the divinity that flickers in us in the form of our self or consciousness. The reason why we don't know this is because our mind is so focused on that external world, the material world, that is fleeting, you know, transitory, and continuously changing. And we're trying to hold on to something that is continuously changing. Uh, at times, it's like chasing our own tails, right? So we never are chasing our own shadows. So meditational practice is about watching what's happening in our mind and learning to be aware of those thoughts and how do we essentially quieten those thoughts you know, how do we divinize those thoughts so that we out learn to outlive? Only through jnana yoga, you can practice ev anything, but only through jnana yoga, one will be able to attain the purushottama yoga, the yoga of God-realization, that oneness with that divinity, the creator, you can call it whatever name. And this is what God-realization is, and this is what Swamiji speaks about, uh, I got, you know, in Tamil, he gives some beautiful, um, you know, uh, uh, statements which are so profound. So uh, I've, I've said that many times in our center, the, the, the statement of how, you know, through exploring and discovering the power of the human mind, he was able to acquire this wisdom knowledge that led him to that spiritual compass, ultimately to that God realization state. So there's an evolution of that peaceful mind that leads to a more enlightened and illumined mind, the Paranjodi mind. And that Paranjodi mind leads to that universal mind, that mind of a Mahan. Mahan means Mahatana Nela. That means the most, you know, 
greatest mindset, which is actually the creator itself. So we covered the last time uh, that most of us try to sit for meditation and we find it very difficult. That is because, you know, we have all kinds of uh, entanglements, all kinds of challenges, and we covered that. There are 18 uh, asuric qualities or qualities that make the mind shrunken or what we call negative qualities. But when we, when we understand that qualities and we learn to manage it, treat it, and eventually, you know, um, evacuate it from our mind, you see that slowly, slowly, when the mind, all those thoughts dissipate, the mind becomes a beautiful, you know, place where slowly you see that great divine divinity that is flickering in us starts percolating in our mind. And I showed you the last time. So like when you get rid of the 18 Asuric qualities, slowly the mind, you know, gets hold of that vibration of the material from that material world to the divine, you know, substratum, the divinity from within that is flickering and reverberating in the mind. All this while has been reverberating, but the reverberation of this material world has drowned that reverberation of the divinity from within. What do we mean by the material world? As I said in the previous, these are the negative qualities, so the asuric qualities that reverberate so powerfully that it drowns that subtle divine flicker that is powering our body our mind and our intellect. So as we slowly understand this asuric qualities and slowly remove it, you know, slowly it dissipates our mind, we can hear that reverberation of the divinity that percolates in us as this divine qualities or divine thoughts. So I covered the last time, <clears throat> six qualities that starts emerging when we start slowly that our quality dissipates from us. We become fearless. We're not afraid of anything. That's what the divine spirit in us gives us that ability to say, I can overcome everything and anything. The mind becomes more pure, more innocent, right? The mind, as I covered the last time, the mind then starts searching and acquiring the knowledge of the spirit because the, the reverberation comes from the spirit. The mind that has all the while been in the material realm is now dwelling deeper to acquire the knowledge of that spiritual reverberation. That's the thirst that comes in. You know, you see that when the thirst comes in, nothing can actually prevent you from that search. No traffic jam, no work, no relationships, no material desire will stop you from that search of that spiritual knowledge. Right? So this is something that we see that when you don't have the pangs for the spiritual knowledge, we see that, ah, we say, never mind, we'll do it tomorrow. Never mind the traffic jam. Oh, never mind, we'll... And you see that the mind goes back to that material reverberation. So if you're really serious about meditational, this is what that search should not, none of the material uh, desires or vibrations should drown this spiritual quest. When that happens, we see that our mind expands. As I said, when all this asuri quality dis disappear, the mind expands. The spiritual knowledge expands our knowledge treasure, our creativity. And you see that you become altruistic. You know, you're able to give. This is what Mahan says, the Vallal quality. You know, when you acquire the knowledge, you want to give it out because the more you give, the more you get. The charitable wanting to serve, wanting to, you know, help wanting to be able to step into the divinity shoes, that quality comes in. There's no panjam. Panjam is poverty. All poverty dissipates. 
poverty of the intellect, poverty of stamina, poverty of resources, poverty of hope, all that disappears. The can-do attitude comes in. Also, the ability to control the senses, because the senses can lead you to different directions. You know, it's like the five senses, the five horses, if they're all running in different directions, the chariot will definitely tumble. In that same way, you have full control over the senses. Yes, the senses are important. They are window to the material world, but you have full control over those horses. You know what to look for, what to hear, what to speak, what to sense, you know, and the whole consciousness is a condition to discover the unconditional aspects of our existence. So this control of senses is so important, you know. It also, you know, uh, it, it's linked back to that purity of the mind. And when we have that purity of the mind, the senses too become pure. Right? Sometimes the senses, you know, when they're impure, they lead us into various calamities, you know. We procrastinate, laziness comes in, taking for granted comes in, all this happens. Right? So, yeah, the senses, you know, you know, although my body is tired, although this, no, I'm going to, uh, you know, still push it, maybe rest the body for a short while, come back. And you see that when that happens, you see that you now have a powerful mind that is fearless, pure, that search for the truthful knowledge, that big heartedness, wanting to learn and share. And the discipline of controlling the senses, you see that, you know, your quality of sacrifice, the sacrifice is not to get something in return. You see, the sacrifice, it is it's a higher level of sacrifice, which is the sacrifice without any expectation. You just do it, right? For the mere sake of that happiness, the mere sake of being able to be of service, that you extend beyond your own biology or your own limitations. And this is what that sacrificial mindset is. If you see Mahan, if you see great saints and sages, they worked really hard to tap into this knowledge. I, I you know, I won't, the, the only Mahan or great saint that I've had experience with is our Mahan. You know, he never went to university. He never, you know, but he he never got all the opportunities many of us had. But yet he was steadfast in this quest to know the truth. He worked really hard, sacrificing so many things in his life to tap into that the nectar of that spiritual consciousness. The moment he got it, that's the eureka moment for him. He said, I want to give it to everybody. Even though the person who taught him said, no, you just, you know, observe, give it to the right person. Some say everybody is the right person. You know, everybody that is in need and in quest of search, I should be able to give this to them. So he had this big heartedness to be able to share this knowledge. And he sacrificed. He could have, he was a, uh, 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 you know, a trader, he gave up all that to pursue that search for this knowledge, to make it simpler, so that people of all races, religions, gender, socioeconomic status could actually uh, get that inspiration, get that, you know, self-realization and God-realization as, as he was searching for it for many, many years. Yeah, I want to make it simpler so that you all don't have to struggle that's the sec that's why today you know we still honor him even though mortally he's not here so I covered, I covered this the last time right so I'm going to cover another six more uh you know uh qualities of that mind that we should you know observe very very carefully nurture it and you see that slowly, slowly, the mind becomes more and more peaceful, productive, and powerful. So the next quality is austerity. 
Yeah, austerity is so important. You know, in this modern world of materiality, you know, uh, people want better cars, more cars, more homes, more handbags, more this, more that. So the consumerism is so intensive. They feel that happiness comes when you have more money and buying more things. Now, as I said, is he? Yes, material things are important to sustain the material body, but it should not blind and blunt our senses and our intellect. So this austerity is to live a simple life, no pomp and pageantry, and, and not show off the wealth or just being drenched in that material wealth. Yes, you know, as I said, you know, these material resources are important to sustain the body and the mind and the intellect to a level that it can attain that self-God realization. So this is what, you know, that simple life, you know, a life of, you know, brilliance and, and austerity. You know, my father used to say something which is very powerful. I didn't realize it after many, many years. He says, life should be lived not with pomp and pageantry. He says, the greatest people live like the soul. S-O-U-L. I didn't understand what he was saying. He says, the soul animates everything, but yet you don't see it. What a powerful statement. He says that we should be doing everything without anyone seeing. We have to be like the soul. The soul has a powerful meaning. He says that the soul must be, the first S in the soul is seamlessly integrated in everything. We must be connected to everything, but in a sustainable way. Not on and off. That's what the soul-powered mindset. First, this is what austerity teaches you. That be like the soul, but not observed by everybody. Be the power. First door is that ability to be seamlessly integrated, silent and sustainable. This is the first door of that austerity. The second door is that not to be observed by anybody, but have the outstanding mindset of excellence, the Sarvadakshina, but yet opportunity creating for everyone. That means that mind must be so powerful and outstanding, be a pace setter, but create opportunities for others through the knowledge that it imbibes, absorbs, adapts, and imparts. The you in that soul is that universal values. You know, universal values of what? You know, that don't harm anyone with your thoughts, with your words, with your actions, every religion speaks about the universal values. Imbibe that. Be inclusive, not exclusive. Don't be dogmatic. Be more universal with your approach. This is part of austerity. And the last one of austerity is that, like the soul, it is not caught up by the limitations. It is at the state of a liberation, not impacted by anything. So austerity is living that simple life without pomp and pageantry. Like the soul, it animates all of our body, our actions and all those things. Yet, nobody sees it. So this is how we have to cultivate. Do things quietly, meditate quietly, without anybody seeing Work really hard, quietly, but people see the outcomes, the tages, the glow, the brilliance, 
emanates from one through their thoughts, their words, their actions. This is what austerity is in this context. The mind must be in that brilliant state. The next one is actually straightforwardness. You know, not going back and forth, you see, with our views, you know, and the way we communicate to others, you know, not sugarcoating it or not, you know, flavoring it. When you know the truth, you're able to explain that in a simple way. When you don't know something, you can't explain, right? So this is part of that, the search for that truth. And this is where that spiritual knowledge, when you understand something, it is simple and very clear, right? So here, you know, the way, the views that we get, we need to understand really well, try to introspect, contemplate, reflect, and meditate upon that so that it's clear in our mind, right? When it's clear, we see that when the clarity comes in, it all makes sense. It's all connected. The other aspect of straight, the moment you know that, you see that there is no more that negativity that is dwells in the mind, you know. There is a beautiful uh, saying that, you know, uh, Vedanta the Vedre Orin the Yedam. You say Vedanta, the knowledge of that brilliant, you know, uh, from the Vedas and the scriptures of that spiritual self, the mind, is like a abode that don't have that mugginess, the uneasiness. You know, when you in a hot day, in you know, small hut, there is no air condition or fan and you have a roof which is made out of tin. The heat is phenomenal. You're sweating. There's a sense of mugginess, uneasiness. He says that Vedanta is when the mind is liberated from this uneasiness. The beautiful, wonderful, liberating quality. And we see that when that happens, you see that there's no the, the, the thought would not generate negative things. You won't gossip. You won't speak behind backs. You don't have anything harmful to say about anybody with your thoughts. Right? You know, you won't speak behind their back. You're very clear. Straightforward. This is what it is. This is how I see it. You may not agree with someone, but you're very tactful. You don't have to be harsh. Right? And I see many people... You know, they feel they are right and they want to show everybody they are right. And sometimes they are very harsh. So, you know, you don't have to be mean. right? So you have to be straightforward, clear, gentle and tactful. right? So you have to mean what you say and say what you mean. And this is what that refined mindset is. There's no hidden agenda. You just say, this is what it is. This is how I feel. I disagree. We, we agree to disagree. It's okay. No problem. Don't have to be very harsh. I always say the epicenter of harshness starts and ends with us. And that leads us to the next one, which is actually nonviolence, ahimsa. When we are very clear, simple, you see that, you know, nonviolence is not about uh, physical violence only. It's about our mental violence. You know, ahimsa of the mind, ahimsa of the intellect, and ahimsa of our actions. Right? So when you're very clear, gentle, simple, you see that we would not entertain this harshness in our mind. You see, we cultivate kindness to all and that absence of ill will. You know, and, and this ill will is what sometimes reverberates and causes not just torment the mind, blunts the intellect, but also draws in all the, the dark clouds, all the things that is not supposed to happen to you will start happening. All the demons will show up at your doors. Right? So this nonviolence is so important, the ahimsa of the thoughts, the mind and the intellect. And when you do that, the mind becomes very peaceful and calm, calm and meditation becomes so great. 
And that leads you to, you know, this whole idea of, you know, renunciation, you see, and uh, we see that, you know, the renunciation, we slowly learn to let go things, right, and uh, live to outlive everything, right, so sometimes, you know, we hold on to things, sometimes we cannot let go, somebody said something, we want to write very harsh emails or WhatsApp or call our people, you know, we see that we perpetuate that problem, the negativity, and you see that meditation is impossible. Forget it. Even prayers, you would not be able to do. So there's a sequence of things that we see happens in our When you start one, slowly the chain effect starts happening to us. So the renunciation helps us to let go, live to let live live to outlive, right? And that leads us to that thought of, you know, you know, I want to come back to that renunciation again. You know, it's it's about learning to live to outlive, you know, and uh, that also leads us to the divinizing every desires of us. You know, we may have desires to do this and then, okay, let's, find a way to divinize the desires so that the desires don't, you know, uh, diminish the health of our mind, our intellect, and our body. There are some desires that will ruin our mental health, our intellectual health, and also our physical health. So when we know this, we avoid it, right? But there are some that desires that we learn to outlive it. Experience it and outlive it. Okay. And we have to remember that we, you know, all this material wealth, everything that we, we didn't come with anything. We are here to experience it. We're not going to take it with us. We experience it and we leave it behind for others. So everything that we have obtained while living, we'll have to leave behind, you know, in this material world, somebody else to experience it. So why carry all the grudges and, you know, amass all this material wealth all our lives? Use what is needed for you. Share what you have. If you have abundance, share it with others, whether it's knowledge or wealth or resources to the needy, right? And also share, you know, without harming nature, right? Without taking extracting things from nature. If we take it, we have to return it back, right? So we have to give back people who cannot do it. Like how Mahan, you know, he realized that many people are struggling to acquire this knowledge, is written in the scripture for thousands of years. But he worked really hard to unlock the secret and he made it so simple that everybody can practice this, irrespective of race, religion, as I mentioned, right? So, Liberally, you know, that renunciation means that I have abundance that, you know, uh, I don't have to hold on to anything, right? So learning to live to outlive everything. He, Mahan knew that, you know, he knew the power of the human mind and the spirit. He learned it. He knew how to use it in this material world. And then he said, okay, I'm going to pass it on to the others so that they too can live in the best possible way. And when you do that, you see that you're always in that search for the truth. Right? You may be engaging the material world, even in that material world, the search for what the truth is to outlive the materiality, whether it's the body or all the experiences that comes with it. So that always searching for that maypuru, that which does not change, that which is not transitory, that which is not finite, right? So you see that there is something within us that is infinite, transcendental, eternal. And that search, whatever that comes, which is material, you know, we experience it and we outlive it. And that ultimately leads to that, our true state of our existence. So the mind now is saying, okay, I'm experiencing this. I will outlive this too. So why get caught up by this? 
right? Ultimately, you see that dissipates. And you see that as you go along, all the knots in our head starts disappearing. The fear, anger, all those things. When that starts disappearing, the mind becomes so calm and cool. You're always smiling. You're always in the state of, wow, that wonder. And you see meditation becomes so great. Right? So this is a way of living, you know, that this great Mahans teaches. You want to experience that self-realization and that practice of that inner journey. We need to get rid of all those cobwebs that prevents us from acquiring this, this knowledge. And you see that finally, you see that in this, he says that when you do all this, you're able to nature, nurture patience and calmness and sublimity. The mind doesn't get agitated by things. Although you may have people who are agitated, you know, say agitating things, you say, okay, never mind, let it go. Right? So you see that you don't get agitated by things and people or experiences in life. You don't become bitter. I know many people that are so bitter. Oh, somebody did something to me and they cannot get, get rid of this. And that straight jackets them. Oh, something happened to me. So this mindset teaches us to transition from that scar to stars. It's okay, something happened to me. Okay, maybe it's to nudge me in a direction that I need to start rethinking, recalibrating refining so that I use that as a foundation for new discoveries. So you see that, you know, we learn not to be agitated by the experiences, the people, the circumstances in our life. We live to let live. We stop brooding, complaining, you know. I've seen sometimes people that are small thing, they become explosive. They say, oh, that person is not good. This person is that and that. The focus is so much on so much negativity. And you see that all the negative, de all the demons come into their lives. So we see that this cult, so the moment the mind gets agitated, step back and say, look, I'm not going to let this grip my mind. Right? So this is what awareness is, self-awareness is. Right? And we see that slowly, slowly, you recognize the thoughts that make your mind shrunken and you leave it outside and it'll, it'll go away. And slowly, slowly, you start seeing that you cultivate patience, persistence, nothing will distract me, and perseverance. It improves our mental productivity, our peace, and mental prosperity. The mind starts thriving and reveling in that infinite spirit. Right? The mind would acquire that inner resources to still remain calm, cool, and powerful. And this is what these great saints and sages have taught. That it is very simple. It doesn't cost any money. It doesn't cost any travel pilgrimage anywhere. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars to go to this place and that place to acquire this self-realization, God-realization state. The only pilgrimage is the pilgrimage every day within yourself, that universal peace sanctuary in you that Mahan talked about. By simple cultivation of this awareness and putting it to practice. If you did this, you see that, you know, your meditational sadhana, your meditation becomes great. You become peaceful. You become productive. Even in the most difficult person or calamities that you have, you say, okay, never mind. Let me be calm and cool and I'll, you know, engage when they are ready. So this is what I learned from this great master of many years of practice. Yes, I too struggled in the early phase trying to get that vibration, trying, pushing really hard, not realizing that I have to treat the mind and prepare the mind to catch that wind of that spirit, catch that, you know, like how a, a, a sailor or, you know, 
the sailboat tries to catch the wind. If you don't know how to catch the wind, a, a sailboat, you go in circle. But you master that wind and know how to catch the wind in your sail, you move tremendously very fast. So these qualities prepare us to learn to catch that wind of that spirit. And that leads us to our spiritual compass that ultimately leads us to that God realization state. This is what this great master has taught me. And when I discovered this, I discovered the greatness in every scripture. And I hope that you too discover this. Next week, I'll speak about the other remaining six qualities that brings us to the completeness of how as we overcome those Asuri qualities, these divine qualities that, you know, grapples our mind, expands our mind, leads our mind to peace and tranquility, you know, productivity, and ultimately that spiritual and intellectual prosperity. Sandoshan to everybody.